I'm so excited. All right. This webinar is being live streamed. It is 6.01 and we are so excited to be here. Um, as soon as the superintendent joins us, we're gonna get started. Hi, PSD. Hi, everyone. Hey, everyone. Very Oh my goodness. I didn't realize we were going to have so many folks jump on the webinar directly. That's fun. Oh my, are there? Oh, yay. Oh, that. wow. That's exciting. I agree. I didn't know that. Hi, Hilda. Hi, everybody. Oh my gosh, this is so fun. Oh my goodness. I love that we have captions. I'm watching it on my phone. This is, this is, we are leveled up with the tech today, everybody. I mean, we're very fancy. Do we, do we, I don't think I'm the one who says to put on the, the world, the globe, right? <laughs> what? This is Should I help you make an announcement in Spanish, if I may? Please. Sure, buenas tardes, buenas tardes. Las personas que necesiten escuchar en español, en la parte baja de su pantalla hay un símbolo del mundo en donde pueden ser click y seleccionar el idioma en español. Si están usando un celular, también en la parte baja va a haber la palabra more, más, o tres puntos seguidos en donde también pueden seleccionar el idioma en español. Thank you. We are very excited. We have some super incredible panelists here and superintendent is almost here. We have some great speakers. Um, you know what I'm gonna actually do right now is I'm going to, um, do we, Rachel, do we have our 100 day doc that we can drop in the Facebook live? And we can, I don't think I can drop it in the, yeah, I actually here do it I do can it. figure out how to drop it here so anybody who's on the webinar webinar you can look in the Q and a and you can see um, <clears throat> the document I just dropped um, Amy is asking is there a live transcript I think that there's closed captioning is that what you mean um, thanks. Hi, everybody. Hi. This is so great. Was that Amy Bogart's asking? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Amy, we've got closed captions. It's super cool. And thank you for asking. Well, hello, Superintendent Carvalho is here. We're so excited. Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon. This is very exciting for us. I'm muted. No. No. You're good. We hear you. Hi. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Jenna Schwartz, and somewhere on your screen, you have Nicole Pfefferman and Rachel Wagner. The three of us are all LAUSD parents. Um, Nicole is also an LAUSD teacher, and in an effort to um, help parents start subbing, I have also become a LAUSD substitute teacher. So we really run the gamut around here. Um, and most importantly, we run this incredible group of LAUSD parents, teachers, and staff called Parents Supporting Teachers. And we're just really grateful to have you here with us today. We have been talking a lot about the 100 day plan. We've been sharing it. We've been sort of dissecting it and um, we're hoping that folks are familiar with it here. We have some incredible parents and teachers coming on here today to share their stories with you, their hopes with you. And we truly appreciate you taking the time to be here to listen. Um, however, while it does seem that if anyone was going to have a solution to these problems, it would be you. Um, I don't know that you ever sleep. You seem to always be the busiest person I've ever seen, which is incredible. 
Um, and we do look forward to hearing feedback from you after our meeting. And we dedicated some time at the end of the meeting to get feedback from you as well. Um, because we had so many incredible speakers that we didn't have time for, we created a document, which we specifically aligned with your 100 day plan. And we're sharing it with our members and with you, everything that couldn't be said in our time together. So we hope that you'll consider looking through it and maybe even having your office send us some answers back. Um, our goal for this is for this to be the first of many conversations and for our group to have a long and mutually beneficial partnership with you and your office. So welcome to LAUSD superintendent and welcome to parents supporting teachers. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, whenever you're ready to get started, Danny, I know you want to capitalize on the time and uh, <laughs> I'm ready to go. Awesome. I'm muted, of course. I don't know if you have heard a little bit about who we are and how we got started, but this is a group that started uh, in 2018 in preparation muted, right? in like the few weeks leading up to the UTLA strike. Um, and a group of us at Colfax Elementary in the San Fernando Valley got together to figure out how we could best support our teachers and our staff and, and, our, and ourselves, really, um, through the teacher strike. And Jenna was one of those parents, one of those parent leaders who came to my house and sat on my kitchen table and said, we're going to start a Facebook group to keep everybody sort of plugged in and informed. Um, and three years later, here we are. It just sort of exploded overnight. It became this incredible, you know, organic and vibrant community of um, teachers and parents and community members and caregivers and staff. And um, it's been an incredible journey with everybody here in this community. So that's us. Tell us about you. Well, um, as you know, I'm 40 days on the job feels like four years, uh, but as you know, uh, I served in super, as superintendent of Miami for 14 years. Interesting comparison during the time period that I was superintendent of Miami, you have had nine different superintendents in Los Angeles uh, with varying degrees and theories of action, uh, different leadership styles, forcing an oscillation of a theory of action and priorities in the system uh, from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum. I'm not passing judgment, it's just a reality, right? Each person coming in with, uh, with an ambitious plan and facing different crises and challenges. But I think uh, by now you know a lot about me, probably you know more about me than I know about you individually. But uh, you know, I see myself in the faces of the kids we, we educate. Uh, I am an immigrant to this country an American by choice, not by chance. I grew up in poverty, one of six, uh, the only one to graduate high school and, uh, and to go to college, I had to leave my country and uh, come to the States. First, New York City, where I was the best dishwasher in Manhattan. I worked construction, I worked the fields. I did everything I needed to do, uh, but ultimately education uh, turned a once homeless kid uh, in Miami uh, to the educator I am today. And uh, I'll address one question that uh, people have for me. Why would you leave the safety and the comfort of Miami to come to LA considering the multifaceted crisis that we continue to face? And I can talk about what that crisis looks like in short term and long term. And a short answer for that uh, is uh, I, I'm tired of hearing mainstream America uh, beat up communities like Miami, communities like Los Angeles. And I think uh, the natural tendency is we are uh, too big to be understood. We're too different, too diverse. We represent sort of a new face of America that some people have uh, a discomfort with. And uh, I want to elevate uh, LAUSD uh, to the premier spot of urban education in America. Um, is it going to be difficult? Yes. Is it impossible? No. Is it likely? Yes. Is it inevitable? I believe it is. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to be able to do it alone. It's going to take a lot of voices, a lot of work, a lot of strategy, a lot of support, and a lot of discussions. And what I can promise you is this. Uh, I've never met anyone who I love deeply that I didn't disagree with at some point. I've been married for a long time. Trust me, there are disagreements. I have a 30-year-old daughter. Love her to pieces. I disagree with her quite often. But at the end of the day, we always can carve out common ground, right, around the space that's most important. 
And that's what I hope to carve out here in LA is enough safe space for us to agree on the really important issues. And uh, so far, 40 days in, I have not seen anything. I have not met with anyone, despite some of the tensions and conversations that I've been faced with, uh, that tells me that it is not possible. It is possible. So I am thrilled to be superintendent. I'm thrilled that there are powerful voices in our community. And I am uh, really anxious uh, to continue this work. And uh, if, you, if you would allow me, I'd like to just take a few minutes to really cover uh, you know, a topic that you were discussing, which is the 100-day plan. I think uh, you and I know that it is a plan that's based on not core beliefs that I brought to LA, core beliefs that you believe in, uh, that we believe in as educators, as, as parents, as supporters of public education. Obviously, equity is a lens through which we uh, approach every bit of this work. It is work and a promise and a theory of action based on empowerment, empowerment of student voice, of parents, of the workforce itself. And obviously it is a plan that is centered on a core belief of excellence, you know, sort of the North Star uh, toward which we angle every bit of this, uh, of this work. Now, if we know what the core beliefs are, then there are four key actions that we will embrace uh, as part of this plan. We don't start uh, from ground zero. Uh, the board has established already specific goals. In 2021, the board adopted goals specific to literacy proficiency, numeracy proficiency, specific to post-secondary success and post-secondary placement, uh, but also specific to the systems of social and emotional support. They need to be in place in an effective, universal, ubiquitous, accessible way, both for our students, but more and more, as we recognize for our employees as well. For a long period of time, we thought that kids lived through trauma and emanated and emerged out of the COVID pandemic uh, with a degree of trauma that needed to be addressed. It took us a while to recognize uh, that uh, the workforce, particularly teachers, experienced a trauma and lived through trauma as a result of the social isolation as well. Uh, we will tackle that. It is with that in mind that uh, these four sequential steps uh, are unfolding. The first one is exactly what I'm doing right now. So I am in a period of learning. Unfortunately, I cannot learn and then apply. This is sort of building the bicycle as I'm riding it. I need to learn and put into practice some of the immediate uh, crisis level emergencies uh, wrapped around urgency that cannot wait. So engaging with, with parents, with students, with business partners, with parent advocates, uh, with entities in our community that I need to learn from, to listen to, to understand perspective and perception. Sometimes perspective and perception may be different but I cannot ignore either. Secondly, uh, once we are done with our engagement as far as listening, and by the way, that will be ongoing, we really need to huddle internally and assess. And this is a district that's actually quite data rich. We know exactly uh, by disaggregating the data, how English language learners are doing, how students in poverty are learning, homeless students, kids in foster care, how students in various zip codes in our community are learning. So disaggregating the data, analyzing it, doing a deep dive and understanding the trends of enrollment, the trends of learning, the trends of achievement, the, the trends of attendance, which was accurately reported today in the LA Times is what we will do uh, during the assessment uh, period of time. It is uh, during that type of period of time that we will actually acknowledge the challenges but also begin to identify the opportunity short-term as well as long-term. And then we have a responsibility of providing feedback back to the community, right? We listened to the community to begin with, we assessed where we are. Now let us report back to the community to promote responsiveness and actually engage the community in being part of the solution. This is work that's not going to be done in a vacuum. It's not going to be done in separation from the community voice. It's going to be done in conjunction with the community voice, with the community activism and the support. And then last but not least is actually an exciting part of the, of the step uh, at this plan, which is those deliverables, those immediate actions that can be leveraged within the first 100 days. Some of them will be actual products, material products, initiatives. Others will be plans to be implemented in weeks, months, and years uh, to come. So it is then in mind that we actually move forward and 
some examples of immediate and, and uh, planned actions short term are uh, well known to you, I believe. Uh, you know, we are a massive school system with great intentionality, remarkable availability of funding. However, in the middle of that job market crunch, uh, what that means is that there are open positions in schools that uh, were not staffed yet. I have a solution for that, for there are enough certified individuals that can actually populate positions in schools in dire need, recognizing the social and emotional needs of our students, of hiring psychiatric social workers. But look, the plan was flawed to begin with, with the best of intentions, a plan that recognized the opportunity to hire over 900 psychiatric social workers when the entire state of California and Texas together do not graduate 400 per year. Uh, so it is a challenge to begin with. I think it's important to develop uh, a coherent state advocacy strategy, as well as a federal advocacy strategy. Right now, there's a massive uh, investment from the state and federal level. All of that will go away in two years. What is our strategy to avoid a fiscal cliff that could lead uh, to compromising positions and programs? We cannot accept that. Launching a parent academy uh, to empower parents with the, the tools, the skill sets to navigate this massive system knowing how to ask the right questions to better support their students, creating an echo of learning at home. I know, understand, and believe in the Black Student Achievement Plan. It needs to be better resourced and more strategically resourced than what I know it to be right now. Increasing inclusion opportunities for students with disabilities. Better said than what I see in practice, and that needs to change. Increase also achievement of English language learners. Improving the quality of food that our kids eat, greening our school spaces, and obviously addressing the mental well-being of our students and a workforce. A detailed list of all these deliverables are actually reflected in the actual plan. So it is with that in mind that, uh, that the next steps become quite evident. Uh, and here I am. I am listening to the voices of the community. Uh, we will be streamlining processes to really approaching the conversation always identifying the main thing, the main question, the main issue, developing major focus of areas and key strategies to tackle these intractable, seemingly intractable issues, and then force this work to really be the stimulus and the catalyst for the development of a five-year strategic plan that I will launch and accomplish in four years. My contract is four years. So the five-year plan needs to be compressed into four years worth of work and deliverables. And, uh, and the last piece is one that recognizes truth and transparency as, as part of this public uh, work that we are embarking on, which is a commitment to continued engagement and really to turn not Alberta's vision, not LAUSD central office vision, but our collective vision, a shared vision into the results we hope to see uh, in our students. And those results very quickly, increased numeracy, increased literacy, increased graduation rates, post-secondary success, and a qualified workforce that is stabled, a student body that is protected, ambitious, gifted, and promising. Seems like it's an easy journey ahead. It is not, but it's not an impossible journey. And what I know is with the appropriate level of belief, skill, and will, anyone's impossible can become everyone's inevitable. That's why I'm in LA. And hopefully that's why uh, we are meeting here today to elevate the quality of education and possibility for our entire student population in the process, improving and increasing the quality of life for Los Angeles as a whole. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. Mr. Superintendent, uh, we are just you know, as Jenna mentioned early on, so excited to have you and we uh, are looking forward to your leadership and the passion and dedication that, that you bring. Um, we are gonna, we have a few special guests with us this evening. We have parents representing um, all areas within the district who would like to share some questions, some, some areas of concern for you. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and begin and introduce our first parent. Uh, Ms. Taylor Aredia from Board District 3. We'll welcome Taylor on. Taylor. 
Um, it says that I cannot start video because the host has disabled it. So just wondered if there's something else I can do. It's superintendent, you have to understand that part of our charm is <laughs> that tech woes follow us everywhere. So Hi. here is Taylor. Hi, thank you so much Hi. for having me. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is along the lines of what I'm gonna ask about. So I appreciate that. I'm a mom to three kids and I have a third grader, seventh grader and a 10th grader. I'm very proud of them and we have been very grateful to be a part of LAUSD. One of the many important areas of concern that has been present in my 11 years as a parent with the district, but is heightened now in the last couple of years is the inconsistent and minimal mental health awareness and supports. Over the years, my oldest daughter has witnessed students as well as teachers in mental health crises on campus. Although this is not unique to her, what stands out is that she nor any of her friends have any consistent knowledge about who or what's available to them. The occasional workshop to teach parents about mental health awareness is very wonderful, but then what after that? A post on Schoology from the counselor with an email contact requires students to have self-initiation, confidence, or resources that many just don't have. Students need consistent mental health education and supports during the school day as obvious as the curriculum, starting in elementary and not just waiting until crisis mode later on. How we cope how we learn to cope as a child impacts our abilities as we grow, which is a lot of what you were saying earlier. Uh, we regularly see the district starting programs or trainings that have a lack of follow through. Are there any plans to partner with LA County and or service providers to address this? And what can the district do to implement consistent, meaningful, obvious and available mental health supports for students and staff? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Taylor. So very quickly, it's yes, yes, and yes. So we should be smart enough and honest enough that we cannot do it alone, number one. Two, there are powerful community resources that need to be engaged in a collaborative way so that the value add of what we individually bring to the table becomes a force multiplier. I think this district did immense great work in terms of testing, vaccination, all the protocols, quite frankly, in a way that in many other areas across the country belong to the county. School districts themselves didn't do contact tracing. That's something that usually county health entities do. So is there the possibility and the urgency to collaborate? Absolutely. Secondly, you hit on the point that is so true. Sometimes we create opportunities for parents to engage services with the expectation that the parent knows how to navigate the system. And that is often not the case. That's why in the 100 day plan, we are launching and building the Parent Academy. The Parent Academy will be a dynamic approach to parent engagement, providing parents with coursework, helpful uh, tools to navigate critical issues. And there's one that quite frankly, at this point overpowers many others. And you mentioned it, mental uh, well-being, social and emotional support. The Parent Academy will address it. Secondly, through viable partnerships, not only with the county, but other entities in our community will become supplemental providers of supports where we cannot hire the professionals because they do not exist in the labor force. Then we will contract with not-for-profit and private sector entities to deliver those same services. Lastly, there is an opportunity for us to use technologies and powerful connect, uh, connecting tools that currently exist in terms of reaching out and connecting with students, with parents and the workforce in terms of the provision of social and emotional supports, the likes of hotlines of support, face-to-face -face referrals provided through the school system, but then on to agencies beyond the school system. This is one where it's not an either or, it's a both and approach. It's all hands on deck. Thank you so much. I wanna introduce our next speaker who is a teacher from Board District One, Dana Goldstein.
Good evening, Superintendent Carvalho. I am Dana Goldstein. I'm a teacher at Pio Pico Middle School, and I've been a part of this amazing community for 26 years. In January, we were shocked and devastated when we were told that the district would be dissolving our school and moving another school onto our campus. This was the first we had heard of this and the community was not involved in the discussions surrounding this community school closure. While we understand that we are in a period of declining enrollment, removing neighborhood schools from families that depend on them only impacts communities negatively. You've spoken about choice and giving families good options, but does that include making our neighborhood schools strong for the families that attend? Neighborhood schools are at the heart of their communities and should be always be available as a family's choice. You just spoke about a plan that spoke about truth, transparency, and communication. None of that has happened at Pio Pico. There's been no truth, no transparency, and no communication. Also, we'd like to know if you can please schedule a meeting with the staff, parents, and students at Pio Pico so we can discuss, discuss our concerns with you. Thank you. So Dana, uh, thank you, number one, for your voice in this matter. Uh, look, I, I, uh, everybody knows the game whack-a-mole, right? Uh, Pio Pico is one of several issues that keep popping up across the district. Uh, sadly, without a coherent district-wide methodology that is fair and well understood by the constituencies surrounding these schools. So I'm dealing with uh, Pio Pico, I'm dealing with a Westchester Wright a middle school issue. Uh, I am dealing with Trinity. So there are a number, and the more I scratch, the more I find, right? So I've asked staff to actually do a radius of impact specific to uh, entities like Pio Pico for me to have a universal understanding so that when I, Dana, make a decision and bring a recommendation to the board, one that will be informed not only by the voices of the board or principals or local district staff, but also through the stakeholders of the communities that includes parents and teachers, yes, is one that will not be dissimilar from future decisions uh, that speak to similar issues facing Pio Pico. I think one of the greatest vulnerabilities is when we make a decision in one school, but then we don't follow the same theory of action in another school facing similar circumstances. That is why I'm taking some degree of time to really understand this issue because it is consequential. Um, I think I am very close to being ready to engage in a larger contextual conversation with the stakeholders now that I've done, I believe, sufficient research. In fact, I have visited some of the sites that are facing some of these circumstances and challenges, and I will continue to do so and count on me to be an attentive listener uh, before making decisions that are no doubt consequential uh, to the communities. I cannot defend, last thing, Dana, I cannot defend or judge, right? the course of action or interactions that took place prior to me arriving. Uh, and it is, uh, it is sad that to a certain extent, there are some perceptions or perspectives that, uh, that uh, see the prior engagements as not necessarily being fully transparent. So I'm in a catch up mode on matters like this one, but I am giving it uh, due process rights that the issue deserves. And uh, part of that due process is absolutely inclusive of all voices. I cannot tell you what the final decision will be here, would not be fair, right? But I am embracing a process that will not exclude your voice. Great, thank you so much, Superintendent. Um, I'm gonna ask this question uh, as a parent myself in Board District 4, in addition to all of our other parents and parent supporting teachers, and it's related to communication and consistencies and procedures. Um, so while you are assessing communication, we wanna point out that the inconsistencies in communication from one school and local district to the next, it often feels like the game telephone. For example, one school is giving in-person tours, hosting open houses, and allowing parents on campus, while another school is being told these things are not allowed. One school gets messaging about COVID protocols and exposure notifications, 
while in other schools messaging is either completely different and in some cases not existent. How do you plan to streamline and truly update the LAUSD communication system so that all parents can get consistent, accurate, and timely information equally across the district? Thank you. So Rachel, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I, I didn't know, I had no idea you were gonna ask that question, but I actually so appreciate it. Um, if I use the word coherence one more time, uh, within my social, personal, and professional circles here at Beaudry or across the close to three dozen schools that I have visited since I got here. Uh, it, it, is, it is absolutely important. So I'm going to agree with you. There is a lack of coherence and consistent practice and communication protocols across LAUSD. This is a function of this fluctuation of the pendulum of leadership from highly centralized protocols to absolutely decentralized, uh, totally autonomous protocols. That may be convenient for the professionals, but may, may not necessarily be understood by the stakeholders, the consumers of the end product, right? The end user, the student, the parent. So count on me, and this is part of the 100 day plan. I spent probably two, three hours with the senior leadership here at Beaudry tackling this issue, speaking directly with local district superintendents, uh, basically conveying that there is a need to embrace, publish, uh, and live up to common practices, homogeneous practices that are universally understood and universally applied specific to courses of action that are applicable to schools on a daily basis. And that is athletic activities, extracurricular activities, the presence of individuals in schools, the participation of not-for-profit and community groups in schools, access to schools, the availability of after-school programming, but it's beyond that. It's also common progress monitoring tools that considering the mobility rate in, in Los Angeles, a parent should not have to go back to school to understand how to decode the new school once they move. And the fact that one school may fall within one local district, a block away from another one, we're talking about two different worlds. In the curriculum we use, the progress monitoring tools we use and how we communicate to the parents. So you hit the nail on the head. We need great coherence. We spent hours today addressing that, I promise you, that communication protocols, particularly beginning with the most important issues, shall be streamlined and shall be directed in the way that is easy to understand and universally consistent, regardless of the zip code that that school occupies or the residence of that parent. I hope I'm sort of demonstrating that through my social media presence. You know, when I put something out there, I I'm not mincing words. You know, it is what I believe in that's going to be replicated and amplified in every bit of communication protocols and practices across LAUSD. Um, yeah, well, we all look forward to that. Um, it's been a challenge and part of sort of the magic of parents supporting teachers is that we've, we've sort of functioned as a translator of, of the district for families. Um, and so we're thrilled to hear that, that um, there's gonna be a shift in communications. Um, so I am very, um, Proud to introduce a parent from Board District 4, Debbie Maloney. Debbie, you're muted. <laughs> thank you. So thank you for your responses so far. I'm very inspired by all of your responses and um, very inspired by your presentation thus far. I am a parent of a child that's in 10th grade at Low Cranch Special Education Center, Special Education Center District 4. She is nonverbal. She has multiple disabilities, a min a minimally ambulatory, and needs help with basically all of her daily needs. And on behalf of the parents of Low Cranch, we have been continuing to bring attention to the LAUSD and the board members about concerns about the future of our school as being a special ed site. Um, it seems that the moderate to severe population of children with disabilities is lacking some um, vision in the district. 
We strongly believe that Low Cranch should become a permanent special ed school site for the long term and not just year to year. We are parents of a very special population and we're feeling overlooked at this time. We are happy that your plan increased, talks about increased inclusion, but we get really concerned when we talk, hear about increased inclusion because we don't know what that looks like for our kids. And we're concerned that when we talk about bringing children like ours with moderate to severe disabilities to gen ed sites, that um, that's not a good fit for them. Sometimes these gen ed sites do not have, um, they don't meet the needs for their uh, mobility, for their safety, for their changing needs, for basic hygiene, feeding, and any other supportive care. You know, inclusion is not one size fits all. And I get very concerned when we see comments about increasing inclusion because our children tend to get lost in that and that um, they are, the, I think in this community, they're the least likely children to get lost because they don't have a voice. So what my, I guess my question is, what are plans for sites like Low Crants considering your commitment to increased inclusion? Yeah, so, so Debbie, number one, thank you so much for so eloquently laying out uh, the protective uh, perspective that a parent would have for any child, but particularly a child with disabilities, right? So I wanna be very clear about one thing. I am a huge proponent of inclusion, but I'm also a huge proponent of following the law and above the law following what's in the best interest of children. Correct. Inclusion simply means the least restrictive environment for children. But that same law also speaks, Debbie, to the appropriate environment for children. There are instances where for some children, the most appropriate environment is one that, that quite frankly is an environment that may not necessarily be as you, as you termed a gen ed population. So what I do believe in is yes, inclusion, but also most appropriate environment for children considering their innate abilities, their uh, their difficulties and challenges. Let us not embrace this one size fits all. So nobody should be hearing my desire to increase inclusionary practices at the expense of recognizing individually what's best for each child. Because that quite frankly is what drives me. I am one who believes that uh, one size fits none. One size fits none. Meaning diversity in terms of opportunities for students, modalities of learning, and the most appropriate environments around them will drive our course of action. I am not uh, entirely familiar with, with the school that you spoke of, so I cannot specifically comment on it, right? But maybe if invited, I will visit. But what I can tell you is that in as much as we will push towards a greater inclusionary practices, it will never be at the expense of the child or children who are best served in an environment that may not necessarily be 100% inclusion. Each yeah. child, their modality of learning, their IEP, their individual educational plan, their 405 accommodation should be the driving forces that create the best environment, the best fit for that child. And that may not necessarily be in a full inclusionary uh, environment as you so eloquently conveyed. Well, we strongly encourage a visit to our campus because it really is a special one. Thank uh, you. Debbie, I, I didn't hear, I didn't get the name of the school. What was it? Locrans Special Education Center in District 4. Got it. Locrans. Got it. Oh my God, I want him <laughs> or her. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I did want to say, Superintendent, we are hearing more and more every day about <laughs> we are hearing more and more every day about um, special ed classes that are going to be closing due to low enrollment. But there is a huge backlog um, in terms of kids being met with. So I just wanted to throw that out there before I introduce our incredible next speaker from Board District Two, Vicky Martinez. Good evening, Superintendent Carvalho. My sons and I have had some troubling encounters with other students and employees regarding LGBTQ plus inclusivity. 
Based on my family's personal experiences, there is not enough training or any specific policy on this in LAUSD, and I'd like that to change. My youngest is in third grade at Aldama and has shoulder length hair and is obsessed with dolls rather than cars or trucks. We encourage him to play and wear what makes him happy. Unfortunately, his peers at school often mock him for wearing maybe a pink t-shirt or cut off shorts and having long hair. Sometimes adults are involved in these incidents. It is my belief that they could handle situations differently and use them as teaching moments, but I don't know what level of training they've had. My oldest is a junior at Franklin High School and he has had many incidents on the cheer squad where he has felt excluded and made to feel not a part of because he is a boy. One example is a megaphone was ordered for him rather than pom-poms. He was never asked which he preferred. I've met with the principal to address concerns then and now, and it doesn't seem as though there is much time or effort put into creating a more inclusive environment for him or any other young man for that matter. This is disheartening to me as I want my children to feel welcome and accepted for who they are. I know these concerns don't apply just to us. I'm sure there are other students across the district that are not being included or considered and maybe no one is there to be their ally. My third grader can teach some staff about being gender neutral and accepting. My oldest wouldn't speak up for fear of retaliation, which also makes me sad. Students should not have to fear discrimination or retaliation for speaking up about what they like or don't or who they are. School should be safe space for all and all students should be able to participate in any school related sports groups, clubs and activities equally. What policies are currently in place for training and resources for adults across the district to better support our LGBTQ plus students and families? And with the understanding that this isn't happening, will you make sure that we have such policies? So Vicky, th thank you so much again for, my God, this group is tackling issues that are so, so important, so relevant, so personally touching uh, to each one of you, right? So I, I'm one who believes in, 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 in uh, intellectually and emotionally uh, opening myself when I hear people bringing compelling stories, right? So understand one thing. There are many reasons as to why I am in LA and not Miami, which happens to be in Florida, a different place in an almost different country. Um, I did battle with the governor of the state of Florida on a regular basis. Uh, on issues like this one, because of the policies that I adopted uh, in my former district that were absolutely dissonant from the policies that the state adopted and continues to adopt, like don't say gay bill in Florida. Uh, when the governor is legislating on transgender, against transgender students and facilities in schools, I objected and I could continue to create safe places, places for students in school. So much so uh, that the LGBTQ community and the student community in my former district, and this will be a reality here, met with me on a quarterly basis, the actual students and the advocates to understand, do we have the right policies in place to the extent we do? Are they being applied and practiced consistently across the board? What else can we do in terms of sensitivity training to avoid bullying practices on the part of students, sometimes out of ignorance, or sometimes even conditioning the attitudes and perspectives of parents. We did that through the Parent Academy. Equally important is creating not only the safe spaces, but the advocates in schools. And in my former role, I did have a save, save, these, this was the LGBTQ coalition that would help us create, train, and place a liaison in each school to be the guardian of the advocate for the convener uh, of all issues dealing with the LGBTQ community. Why? Well, highest rate of homeless participation in most communities, LGBTQ kids. High level of suicide or suicidal ideation drug abuse, sex trade, why wouldn't we provide the resources and the support? So this is an important body of work for me. It is one that I actually know well, will carry from my previous experience. 
I am sorry for the experiences that your child has gone through. And I'm sorry for the heartache that you have experienced. It is unacceptable. Why is this so passionate? Why am I so passionate about this issue? Um, one of my brothers was one of the first victims of AIDS before people knew what AIDS was. I know the pain and trauma he went through. One additional brother dealt for 30 years uh, with the same type of behavior that you are referring to uh, your child having suffered through. It's personal, it's unacceptable. We know better, we must do better. Thank you so much, Vicki, for sharing that. And thank you, um, Superintendent. Um, next, I want to welcome um, Janae Tyler, who is, um, well, she's not, she, she's a parent, she's an activist. Uh, she's a leader uh, in Board District 1. Janae? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, um, thank you for having me, Superintendent Carvalho and PST, Parent Support and Teachers. Um, my name is Janae Tyler and I am an LAUSD parent, parent rights advocate, parent and family organizer with Students Deserve and Reclaim Our Schools LA, as well as a parent and family center director in LD West. I have seen firsthand the direct abuse of children by LA school police, the trauma that they have inflicted on young minds and the ways that they have been used to fuel the, the school to prison pipeline. I've witnessed unthinkable scenes like a 15 year old female student who was thrown to the ground, straddled, handcuffed and mishandled by four male officers wallowing in her own vomit after defending herself for being punched in the face by a male student who ultimately ran off. This young lady was known to have mental health challenges and was already trying to heal from physical and sexual abuse. The way that she was treated was far more than dehumanizing and still makes me cry. In 2021, LAUSD cut the school police budget and removed cops from campuses because they were disproportionately criminalizing and abusing black students. As a black parent, it's important to me that our children are no longer criminalized by police as they have been, but it's also important to me that school police have been replaced with resources, that they're replaced with resources that benefit children like academic counselors, PSWs, school climate advocates, African studies courses as A through G requirements, and so much more. Since the implementation of some of the key supports that came with the Black Student Achievement Plan in August, especially the removal of school police from our campuses, Although not yet in its perfectly imagined form, we have already seen a significant shift in school climates, especially in the secondary levels. Students are sharing that they experience more joy, less fear, and are more focused on learning. So my question, Superintendent Carvalho, is will you commit to fully defunding school police and using that money to further expand the Black Student Achievement Plan so that even more of our children are served by PSWs, academic counselors, college counselors, restorative practices, transformative learning experiences, and again, so much more instead of our children being over-policed and criminalized, sir? Well, Janae, uh, number one, it's good to see you again. I, this, I think this is the second time I see you in, uh, in just as many days. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and my answer now is going to be probably the same that you heard me uh, say before. Number one, I am abhorred. I am absolutely devastated by some of the very visible, disturbing, unacceptable behaviors that we've seen detailed, whether it's in school or outside of school by rogue law enforcement entities uh, that, uh, that are unacceptable in any way, shape or form. Secondly, I am absolutely supportive of all of the interventions you spoke of, whether we're talking about restorative justice practices, counselors, social emotional support entities, we're talking about uh, you know, individuals who have the professional training to meet students where they are, being preventive uh, in their work rather than remediative uh, in their actions in a way that's not punitive to students actually elevates the worth, the humanity, the dignity of students. I am absolutely supportive of that. The board has already opined for budget decisions uh, about a year ago uh, on the police issue. I believe there may be some additional board action 
I am one who is all about and wants to support secure, safe, respectful, respectful school environments. And that's what I will promote. Uh, as I said earlier, on the issue specifically of the police, it is a complex issue. I have my own thoughts about it, as I told you earlier in the week. I'm not at liberty right now of going beyond where I'm at because I'm still having conversations with the board members, uh, with a number of stakeholders. I know it's a big issue, it's an important issue. One that at some point I will be taking action on, but I subscribe, I stand shoulder to shoulder, heart to heart, hand to hand with you on all these issues that school should be and the inputs and the investments that envision the possibility rather than react to the condition. And I will be personally invested in that. And you will see my first budget recommendation will prioritize those elements. Thank you so much, Superintendent Carvalho. You asked me this though, and I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm just like so excited with how everything is going and you've been able to answer, which we weren't expecting. And I just really appreciate it. We have three more speakers and um, I'm thrilled to introduce from Board District 2, Antonieta Garcia. Good afternoon, Superintendent. My name is Antonieta Garcia. I live in the East LA community next to the historical Garfield High School that participated in the late 1960 Chicano walkouts. The school that is right now at risk of our small unincorporated area of LA County of about 7.5 <clears throat> 7 mile radius has a lot of charter schools. They are 64 charter schools in board district two. A large amount of those are in East LA. It's oversaturated with charter schools it's like Starbucks, they're everywhere. They oversaturate East LA without any community input or any type of community assessment. They're everywhere in residential zones, industrial zones, commercial zones. This has negatively impacted our neighborhood public schools. They have taken resource funding students and spaces from LAUSD students. Many of these schools owe the district millions of dollars of co-location fees. They siphon resources and funding from our communities of East LA. Instead of, sorry, excuse me. Oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got a little sidetracked. Side track. Instead of, and, Instead of all of the funding could have gone to fully funding the East LA schools, it could have gone to social emotional support, academic support, art and music programs. The process has not been very transparent. There has been very little oversight and no community input whatsoever. What commitment do you have to oversight of the charter school division? Is it run by a staffer of California, of California Charter School Association, Association, and he regularly ignores and rebuffs emails about violations. These schools are destroying our communities and their scores are any higher. Their results are any better. Thank you. So, um, Antonieta, um, I, I, one of the questions you asked there, there, there was a lot to unpack there to begin with. So yes, there is a strong presence of charter schools of all flavors in LA, the likes of which I've never seen uh, before. So there are independent charters, there are affiliated charters, there are privately managed charters uh, with management organizations. Um, it is almost uh, bewildering, right? Baffling uh, the, the Ben and Jerry's approach uh, to, uh, to sort of choice. I'm a proponent, and you've heard me say this probably, I am a proponent of parental options, but I'm a proponent of parental options provided by LAUSD under the accountability, the guise, the umbrella, the protection for the benefit of students and teachers with the appropriate guardrails of protection, whether it's financial protection, academic protection, in environments that do not segregate students from other students, 
that actually reflect the surrounding communities. Um, if that's the case, count me in. Sometimes that's not the case. And that breaches the, the ethical comportment of Indian environment in the environment of school choice and parental options. So I, uh, in as much as I want to see high quality options available in every zip code across LAUSD, I think we are the providers of that. We have the capacity. And in my 100 day plan, you see that. You see that I desire to see uh, LAUSD present itself as the premier provider of options in areas where right now the competition is dominated by charters. We have a voice, we have a presence. I've seen schools that we have in LUSD with waiting lists of a thousand kids, public schools within LUSD. That tells me that if we replicate those success stories in areas where right now there is the presence of a lot of charter schools, we have the ability to compete. So I am a supporter of our community schools, first and foremost. Secondly, I'm a supporter of high quality programs that excite communities that are run, led by LAUSD. With that said, I recognize there are powerful laws in the state of California that protect the presence of charter schools. Now, you mentioned uh, an entity in terms of supervisor. I, I'm gonna have to look into that. I, I, I don't really know the meaning of that, but trust me, uh, I will research it uh, and understand it better. But my 100-day plan envisions LUSD as becoming the premier entity of quality programs offered in communities. I don't want to see kids bust from their community to faraway locations because that's the school that the parents feel it's best. We ought to have those examples of remarkable offerings closest to where kids live. And that's what we envision in the 100-day plan. I want to map out the deserts of opportunities and replace them or populate them with our own presence. Uh, I'm not ready to give up on our schools, nor am I ready to give the key of our schools to entities that often or sometimes do not necessarily see the potential of the schools in our community for a simple reason. The day we undermine the vital viability and vitality of our public schools, we undermine democracy. I mean, there, there's no two ways of putting it. So I am right now, along with staff, looking at the entire, um, the entire repertoire of choices in the district. I am looking at the viability of charter schools. They ought to abide by the rules. If they're not performing, there ought to be consequences. Right now, as a result of the pandemic, there is a two year grace period that the state afforded charter schools. We need to abide by that, but we ought to be protective at the same time of the schools that in fact represent the values and the principles of LAUSD. That's the entity that hired me. That was amazing, thank you. Um, I'm gonna introduce our next uh, parent speaker from Board District 5, uh, Carmel Levitan is here. Thank you so much for making the time to speak with us today and all the work you've done to improve, to improve communication. I've been following you on Twitter and you know, <laughs> enjoying getting to feel a little bit closer to our district. So I was super excited to see that your 100 day plan mentions that LAUSD is going to plan for additional green space and continuing energy incentives to school campuses. And then on Twitter, you agreed that asphalt covered schoolyards are an environmental injustice. I was really excited to see your excitement there. Um, I myself actually graduated from LAUSD. And I remember when they brought in all those temporary bungalows decades ago because our schools were overcrowded. But now it's very different. Those bungalows weren't actually even ever meant to last this long. And now they're taking a playground space that could be used for our kids. And they also make it seem like our schools are under enrolled because people look and you see these buildings, they seem empty when those spaces could be <laughs> amazing um, green spaces. So I'm wondering where you stand on removing these bungalows greening the areas where they once stood to give our kids the opportunity to enjoy the benefits of green space. And more broadly, how can schools sign on if we wanna be part of your first cohort of greening our campuses, both inside and outside? 
So thank you so much, Carmel. Uh, and uh, look, I, um, as a young kid, I grew up in poverty, as I said, and I grew up in, in, in a neighborhood that there was no green anything. Uh, it, it was poor, conditions inside my place were not adequate, outside of my space, uh, there was not much to it. Um, what breaks my heart here in LA, and LA is not unique, is that in most cases, kids who go to school in areas where they do not see green, they do not see the beautiful environment that they should have access to, are themselves in neighborhoods, they live in neighborhoods that uh, greenery is non-existent as well, meaning the school conditions very much replicate, right, the surrounding community. So the question for me is, when do they ever have an opportunity to see something other than concrete and asphalt? And you eloquently laid out the problem. I mean, temperature in indices uh, are often, you know, vastly different from schools that have green spaces or indigenous spaces versus the ones that were asphalted through or concreted through. Uh, so the fact that I reflect this in my 100 day plan, not knowing that the LA Times would be doing a story on this was very timely. Um, I'm not the originator of this. These were actually early conversations I had with board members like uh, Nick Malvoin or Jackie Goldberg who have been strong advocates alongside the entire board. Uh, on this issue, you know, board president Gona has also been a strong voice, actually all of them. There are powerful advocacy groups in, in Los Angeles that really embrace this concept. So what I want to do is not just do sort of a one off. We are looking systemically right now at creating factors of need. So the square footage, the ratio of green space to non green space asphalt in schools, and then juxtapose that to the same um, to the same denominator in the surrounding communities right to prioritize which schools in what communities should see the greening effect take place first, right? That's approaching the work through the equity lens. That's what we're doing right now. Secondly, secondly, uh, to the point that you made about bungalows. Uh, so in my world, actually, I started hearing about bungalow and bung that sounds so interesting, right? A bungalow. Like when I, you know, a couple of years ago before the pandemic, I went to a beach town and they, I rented a bungalow, it was lovely. But so I came here and said, kids learning bungalows. No, they're portable classrooms, they're portables. And they're supposed to be temporary, right? A temporary solution, not a lifetime solution. So we are looking at that. Uh, I think you make a very, very good point. Uh, the square footage that's currently used, permanent as well as temporary, portable or bungalow as they call it here. Uh, you put all that together and in most cases far exceeds the current enrollment. It is time to provide a technical correction to space utilization and default back to the permanent structure, improve through our capital investments, the permanent infrastructure. Let's have a plan that progressively removes uh, the, uh, the temporary classrooms, the bungalows, the portable classrooms, and let's restore to the extent possible that additional space back to the recreational space that kids and teachers need. And look, here's what I know about kids. I've broken my arm. It's easier to fall on grass or sand than it is to fall on concrete or asphalt. Kids don't come equipped with tires or bumpers. So that should be prima facie evidence of what we need to do in schools. And that's why, once again, my plan reflects this as a priority over the next 100 days. Thank you so much. Um, my heart is so happy to hear you say all these things. Um, you know, I have an elementary school child and I have a middle school child and um, I've taught at two different high schools in the district. I taught at um, Jefferson High School in South LA and I've been teaching for a bunch of years now at Marshall High School. And um, when I initially went to go interview at Marshall, um, I walked through the doors and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like there are trees. You know, I had spent seven years at Jefferson at a campus that was just concrete and it broke my heart for my students. And I was, I actually spent the first year at Marshall very angry <laughs> about that, that my students at Marshall got trees and my students at Jefferson did not get trees. Um, and it's been an honor and it's been a pleasure 
for me to teach in our LAUSD communities for these past 15 years. I'm an LAUSD student myself. I went to Lockhurst Elementary, Hale Middle School, and El Camino Real High School. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sad to say, but that at this point, I'm, I'm planning on leaving at the end of this school year. I am planning on leaving the classroom. Um, and I know that I am not the only one here in Los Angeles or even across the nation. Um, and so my question tonight is, you know, what, what would you say to me? What would you say to teachers like me who have spent so many years, um, you know, decades working within and working around systems that have not supported us um, and have not supported our students um, and, and frankly have just really just ground us down. Um, and so what would you say to dedicated teachers who are contemplating leaving the classroom? Well, so first, Nicole, thank you for the work you've done. I have visited Jefferson actually yesterday. I was at Jefferson High School yesterday. Uh, I had over an hour long conversation uh, with students whose very existence is extremely fragile. And then I was supposed to eat pizza with them, but pizza came with pepperoni and I don't do that. So that was the end of the party for me. But so thank you for, for your dedication and your commitment. Rather than give you an answer, uh, to your question directly. I'm actually more interested in knowing what would it take for you to stay? What would it take? Give me three, three things that would empower me with the knowledge. I, I think I probably know some of them, but why should I respond to a set of circumstances that belong to you? I really would like to know what would it take for me to keep you as a colleague and continue your service to our kids. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, I, there's longer lists than three, but, but if you're asking for the three that have sat in my heart for 15 years. Give, give me three today and then email me the rest. You know my email okay. address, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so number one would be smaller class sizes right off the bat. Um, number two would be having the right and excellent resources available to my students so that they can be, they can feel safe and they can feel prepared to learn. So, I mean, that's, that's a big one, right? That's like clean bathrooms, PSWs, you know, um, uh, amazing electives, ethnic studies, um, you know, no police on campus, um, having, having opportunity to feel, um, proud to arrive at school every day. Like that, that's, that's in my heart, what school should be. Our school should be the jewels of our communities. And then third, I'm, I'm just going to say it more pay. I, I am, you know, I, I went to school to, to become a teacher. I have poured my heart and soul. I've taken time from my family. I've driven myself essentially into the ground. And to be frank, like it's expensive to live in LA. It's expensive to be a teacher, right? I've, I find myself pouring my own salary back into my classroom and into my students, buying snacks, buying resources. Um, art supplies, right? Um, and so, and so I think that those are my, I think my top three. So, so Nicole, um, I, I told you, I probably could predict uh, what at least some of the elements would be. And, and thank you for sharing. I didn't want to put you on a spot, but, but you know, only you. I'm own a teacher. The reason. I can handle it. Yeah. Only you, you know, you own the reasons that would put you in a position of doubting uh, your viability long term as a teacher because of the conditions that you that you described. 
So you saw in the 100 day plan, I do have a desire and actually spent a lion's share of my morning with my team speaking about class size. I don't think we have the capacity to reduce class size across the board, all schools or classrooms at the same time, but we have to start somewhere. Um, I, I try not to mention the district I came from, but I was rather effective at reducing class sizes there with specific thresholds that needed to be observed by classroom and then by average by school, okay? Um, I, I plan to do that here and I plan to begin the piloting of that practice to the extent practicable and possible uh, in the summer, in a vastly expanded summer offering. The second issue that you mentioned deals with workplace conditions, right? The resources, the environment, the culture, the cleanliness, the respect, all of that. Uh, you know, I could lie to you, but I visited a lot of schools three yesterday. I saw some things that were knockout examples of what it should be. But if I walk into a, a restroom and I don't see soap or paper, I know everything else is broken. So um, I'm one when I see that, it takes direct action, conversations with principals, with the operations person in the school, et cetera. And then I bring that information back, I inform the team. I, don't, I would not want my child to be in an environment, whether it is the cafeteria food and its nutritional value, the options, the cleanliness of the restrooms or the culture in the building. I would not want any one of our children to be in an environment that I would not feel would be appropriate for my own child. I'm gonna fight for that. And lastly, you need to do me a favor. Never ever shy away or hesitate saying that pay is important. Um, all teachers got at least a bachelor's degree. The bachelor's across the board cost the same amount of money, whether you're gonna be an attorney, a doctor, or a teacher. If you then pursue a master's, depending on the school, but a master's at Harvard or at USC, about the same. However, once you have your bachelor's, your master's, the differential in terms of earning opportunity and potential for a teacher versus a private sector entity is disproportionate. I addressed this issue with Secretary of Education Cardona, who was in LUSD at my invitation yesterday. I said, you know what? There is a crisis in America that will only grow if we don't respond adequately to it. If we allow that differential to continue to grow, particularly in environments like LA, where the cost of living is high, where the unaffordability of housing is ridiculous. If we do not take the appropriate steps in terms of Sacramento budget and federal subsidies, we will have a crisis in our hands. And that crisis, some people may provide it as a statistical reality, right? X number of thousands of students, of teachers are leaving the profession prematurely and yes, 50% of teachers in America right now are contemplating leaving the profession ahead of retirement. That is startling. But behind those statistics, there's a Nicole. And all I'm gonna ask is, allow me to fight for you um, because we, we can't lose Nicole's. And, uh, and, um, I am exploring every possible opportunity within the budget restrictions we have that we will have to honor the work that teachers do and support staff, but beginning with teachers. Uh, the conditions that you described, uh, they are the bane of my existence. And that's what I look for, inspect and bring leadership and practice to. And ultimately, there is a possibility. I didn't come to LA to lose. And uh, I came to LA to win, but the win doesn't belong to me. The win belongs to teachers, students, support staff, parents, the entire community. And we don't do that unless we elevate the worth, the dignity of teachers themselves, the building blocks of our school system. And ultimately, I believe the enablers of democracy itself. So why wouldn't I invest in Nicole? Why wouldn't I protect Nicole? 
why would not create an environment that allows Nicole to be all that she can be for the benefit of the students? Um, I think you saved the best question for last. Thank you. Um, thank you. I mean, this has, thank you for giving us even more of your time. Um, thank you for trying to save Nicole. She truly is a remarkable, remarkable teacher. Um, this was a remarkable event and I hope you will join us again. This was, thank you. Um, there is a thought exchange that LAUSD is asking for feedback from this event. So we are gonna put the link in and um, hopefully you will provide feedback. Everybody who's watching, we've got, we've got had hundreds and hundreds of people here, superintendent. So it was very, it was just amazing. So I will let you close us out. Thank you. Me? All right. So look, let, let me be the, <laughs> let me be the one who says uh, thank you. Um, this will be the first of many interactions. I appreciate the tone and tenor of, of, of the narrative, the interaction, the dialogue. I really do. Uh, secondly, uh, I appreciate the fact that your input today and the conversations that will ensue will be captured as part of the learn and listen phase of the 100-day plan. Your voices are important and your input indispensable. And it is being collected as an influencer of, of the work in weeks, months, and years ahead. And lastly, I really appreciate and respect, and I, and I, 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 <laughs> I, I use that word in the way that Aretha Franklin would, with all of the sound and glory, right? I respect your voice, your opinion, your presence, your advocacy, um, and uh, all I have to do is say thank you. And uh, apologies for keeping you 20 additional minutes in this uh, bonus session, but I blame it on Nicole's persuasive and eloquent narrative about the worth of a teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank night, you so everybody. Much. Good night, so everyone. Much. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank this you. was wonderful. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then Sarah, you will stop the live stream. We'll post this to our YouTube.